Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are again, another session of Toward a Quality of Life, coming to you from the Roxbury studio of BNN-TV, with the wonderful help of the technicians at the studio. I'm here before you this evening. It is... August 5th in the year 1999 and right now on this day the weather which has been severely hot through much of the summer has broken into a cooler temperature for the day but unfortunately it's no big wonder why the heat we are experiencing here and across other parts of the country country, we are by the way in the northeast, is so severe and so extreme and getting more extreme as the years go by. We've had excessive heat periods in recent years and if you take the overall trends, the heat, the humidity factor is tending to become more and more extreme. This of course due to many reasons, one of the main reasons being the the fumes and chemicals that are released from industry, from, from the uh, emissions of automobiles and other vehicles, and uh, from the energy that we use to, to burn, to run our plants, which creates acid rain, which creates sulfur dioxide, which creates ozone which is not good for us to breathe and which in and of itself makes holes through the protective layer of ozone which is higher up in the stratosphere so this also another reason why, why we're having such radical temperature problems is due to radiation in the atmosphere radiation as it emits from regularly run processes around the world and radiation as it emits from Sub, sub uh, terrain explosions, underwater explosions, and also accidents. There's so many reasons of all the harmful things we are doing to the environment causing this terrible heat and oppressive humidity that we're experiencing. Some parts of the United States have experienced triple digit temperatures back to back day after day of of heights that are unusual even for what are normally hotter areas of the country and some parts of the country are experiencing triple digits that don't usually experience triple digits many people have died due to the heat alone and i bring all this up just to ask you when is it that we're going to wake up and understand that the alarm is going off, that the clock is saying the time is now, that we are in severe trouble with the environment, this is no joke, all the other things that we think about, the things that come to us over the media of television and the internet, the things that occupy our minds such as celebrities and sex and sports, um, feeding ourselves and and clothing ourselves and having fancy automobiles and just pretending putting on air conditioning which uh, in and of itself has a detrimental effect to the ozone that protects us from the sun's ultraviolet rays cannot go on forever we cannot continue to build buildings that are hermetically sealed we should be smart enough to know that we need natural ventilation and we have to stop using energy not only because energy is not forever available to us believe it or not but also mostly because using energy the way we do fossil fuels and nuclear energy ruins the world ruins the world and we ought to know better if we have any sort of intelligence at all just as much as as we're having the heat we could also have uh, more and more severe levels of cold and if you look at recent winters across certain parts of the United States there have been brutally alarming levels of severe cold such that you say if it can push this far down 
this time and this much further down the next time what lies ahead for us in the future again it's time to wake up why we aren't saying why this is not on the minds and tongues of so many instead of just wondering how we're going to get by the heat how we're going to live through it and how we're going to make ourselves most comfortable this is not something that is going to come to a beneficent and this is something that in and of itself uh, has time running out and change must be made immediately drought when need I say drought you should be scared you should be alarmed these are not just flukes of nature these are things that can be shown to be being caused and affected mathematically arithmetically by the pollutants we're putting into the environment by the way we're using the energy that we have by the way we are synthesizing materials on this earth into unnatural elements that don't give us breath and don't give us air and don't give us life and don't give us molecules generated in the traditionally regular way in the atmosphere such that the seasons change gradually and come into being in this part of the country or, in, or if not so gradually uh, in certain systemic traditional way in other parts of the world uh, that we have known in any kind of recent history that we are aware of. If we can't know that it is the cataclysmic changes that we are perpetrating every day here and in China and in Russia and in Argentina and in Florida and in South America and in California and in Houston and in New York and in Hong Kong and in Tokyo and in Beijing if we don't know that it's everything that's pouring into the environment minute, minute after minute as we sleep around the clock that is causing the world to suffer to the degree that it is and even more into the future with a finite end to it a finite circumstance when shall we wake up when shall we be the so-called alert and aware human beings that we think we are and what about our skin I hope you're checking very carefully how much the Sun now burns the skin even in the early part of the season on a sunny day uh, you can easily feel the sun penetrating in ways that it has has never penetrated before and you'll notice that people will get burnt far more easily than they might ever have before of course skin cancers are happening at a greater and greater rate and now it's being told at the present time on television that uh, um, uh, sun blockers perhaps make people get more skin cancer because they stay out longer in the sun effectively however one should not even be using sun blockers these are all kinds of chemicals that sh that don't belong with human life plastics don't belong with human life synthetics don't belong with human life fossil fuels being burned don't belong with human life um, uh, nitric acids don't belong with human life these things that are the results of what we're doing don't fit with us and we're getting cancer and we're getting asthma more and more and more and we're getting temperatures that are so oppressive and so unnatural looking for some fantasy way out of this when the solution is right before our very eyes our eyesight is affected by the strength of the sun both in the summer and in the winter and in regions of Antarctica for example it's already known that animals are blind who live closer to the sun than we do due to the non-protection against ultraviolet rays because the the toxins that are going up into the atmosphere are making holes in the protective layers that keep us from these kind of phenomena trees we don't have enough trees how lovely are the trees even if you go to the country on these oppressive days you will notice instantly a different flavor to the air a different coolness and sensation if you're around where there are all trees immediately how much we need the trees to say the least that they purify the air and exchange what we expirate to use for their own growth and manufacturing 
for that alone, but we also need them for solace and comfort and for something refreshing and lovely to look at. What can be more egregious than slabs of concrete down an overheated tarmac highway on these oppressive hot days? Why aren't we paying attention more? Why isn't this the hottest topic? It's certainly not being brought to us in commercials. It's certainly not being advertised on television. Look at the ways we're also ruining the environment that we're destroying with the use of fossil fuels just by digging for fossil fuels. Every day I read over the newswire of new drillings that either have found oil or unsuccessfully found oil all around the world, especially in newly emerging countries, but also in this country. And think of what this, what this is doing to the ocean. For example, just yesterday I read of a drilling in the Gulf of Mexico that was 13,000 feet deep in Miocene age sands, which are sands that are 10 to 25 million years old. What does it do to dig this deep into the ocean and find oil and gas and then dredge it up? What does it do all over the world in all our closer to shore areas in the ocean? What is this doing to the poor animals and the very intricate ecology of the ocean water and life, plant life and so on, algae life itself? Think about it. Where are our brains? We surely are inane. We surely are rather moronic to tell the truth. Now again, environmentally in a in a different vein somewhat i'm seeing in this very recent week that the usda is going to prohibit the use of malathion i mean that alone gives me the creepy crawlies to even say it even to say the word malathion as i said gives me the creepy crawlies because it is a nerve toxin it is something that causes nerve damage to people this is something that causes disease this is toxic and here i see i know a kind of malathion has been used to kill mosquitoes but you don't hear about it too much because of what it does to the fish when it's sprayed over areas namely causes them to die and likely because the evidence keeps pouring in like one would need evidence for something as as detrimental as this but here i see that something something so toxic that is used to kill mosquitoes and even there there are great uh, controversies or oppositions to its ever being used because it's so toxic to all life here I see that it's being stopped, a, t a kind of melathion, from being used on apples after it's been being used for a long time that I'm biting into apples that are not organically grown, that have melathion sprayed on them, and that have, of course, in the ground accumulated melathion. This is a wonderful thought, and the cancer grows. We have peaches that are going to not have methylparathion in this week used on them, another toxin to, to organic bodies such as ourselves and animals. We have a, a chemical called azine phosmethyl that is not going to be used. And we have phosphates for storing corn and soybeans that is going to likely be prohibited from being used all in this very week. But Think of how much they have been used and all this food being ingested right down to the Kellogg's cornflake with all these chemicals on them in these environments that are overheated and polluted and choking to boot. And we have the manufacture of plastics, polystyrene, polyurethane, which is so deadly to be inhaled and used in, in industrial uh, capacities. We have polyethylenes. We have the plastic bags that we use and are choking us off. Those are, those are kinds of things that don't belong with natural, organic, biologic life. They are antithetical to it. They are unlike it and don't match with it whatsoever. And all this plastic that we're accumulating, which suffocates life, that doesn't degrade for the most part. The rings around the beer bottle cans, all this plastic, I was in a, um, 
a retail store and as people return things to the store they just throw away the plastic and the bins pile up with plastic bags and then they just throw this away where is our sense where is our awareness where is our awareness about radioactive waste why are these things not on our very top agenda if we don't have air to breathe if we don't have life if we don't have cancer free situations if we don't have freedom from neurological disorders and every other adversity that we are visiting upon our very own self when we have such a beautiful nature if we just respect it and treat it like it should be treated why are we not alarmed and having this at the top of our agenda in instead of trying to shield ourselves and entertaining ourselves with things that really have no meaning for the most part and no bearing on the life we're trying to live as we try to run to the hospital and the doctor and take care of our diseases or try to get into more air conditioning against the heat or try to get into more warm against the cold as it gets worse and worse and worse. Radioactive waste, how dare we accumulate more radioactive waste? How dare we even begin to listen to somebody say nuclear energy is a good thing because it's a clean fuel? How dare we when we have radioactive waste for which there is no place to put it, period, which absolutely corrodes through everything over time? and which absolutely corrodes through human life and destroys it, or any life for that matter. By the way, remember those poor frogs all over the world that are, that are being born without limbs or being born unable to live, being born with all kinds of deformities. Are not some of these chemical pollutant problems the matter of why this is happening and are they not the canary in the mine shaft aren't the children at children's hospital forgive me those of you who might have someone in that circumstance are not the children bald with cancer born with heart deformities at rates never before are they not a signal that we are awash in cancer disease provoking environment ruining life destroying circumstances not to be alarmist, ladies and gentlemen, to be real. And where is the presidential candidate who will stand up and say, environment, 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 where is that candidate? What do you have if you don't have environment? And where is all the industry which must get together en masse across the board and cooperatively work out how we're all going to concede for our own health and welfare, how the short run is no long run and it cannot stand and everybody is going to have to change habits together. This has to be worked on together. It is our only priority. For one individual or a few individuals working with their own organic reusable bags or no bags at all better yet with bulk food with non-cartonized food with organic food just a few individuals do, or not driving cars just a few individuals is not enough we need everybody because one one person doing it can't be so inconvenient to try to live when everyone around has the advantages the momentary advantages of technology and energy consuming kinds of machines and mechanisms to work with and, and uh, ways of, of doing vast harvesting with, with potent chemicals and so on. Other people then who on a small scale want to do the right thing aren't able to survive in a normally competitive way, not just to compete, but just to even stay alive and hold one's own. It has to be done across the board so that we're all conceding the same way and thereby can, can work on this problem together and not have it be a personal disadvantage to any one or two of us. And why is the money flocking to one presidential potential candidate, flocking without even barely being asked? Why is that money running towards a certain individual? 
And why aren't there big debates going on or why are they not going to be set up for what kind of things are facing people squarely in the face that need to get done, that, need, that, that are alarming and that need some sort of coordinated effort to be, to be changed? Why instead are we hearing commercialized gimmicks about personal lives and uh, the shine or charisma of people? And where are the stalwarts standing up to say, environment is in terrible condition? And what kind of battle are we in the midst of where the struggle is really between, to a great degree, those that would like to change or know we need to change how we're doing things very fundamentally versus those who want things to stay exactly the same, make more plastic bags, make more aluminum cans, aluminum, make more automobiles, make automobiles that use more gas, explore more, try to find more gasoline underground, try to find more oil underground, continue to throw any kind of materials into the atmosphere, choking off life, continue to throw any kind of heated water into the oceans and ponds and other kinds of chemicals continue to cause habitats for natural life to be chopped down and any kind of construction in any namby-pamby kind of way continue to make this a sizzling hot barren choking or severely freezing to a not humanly tenable point kind of planet. And corporations, as they exist, control everything, including the government in theory, to a great degree, by the finances that they supply and by the clout. When, when negotiations are done for various enterprises in this country regarding how we will have internet, how we will communicate via phone and other means, how we will have energy, what kind of energy, if any, it will be. It's not done coming to the table with government for what people need to live, any people, rich people, poor people, in between people. It's not done with that in mind. It's done with competing forces in the market trying to get their products to have the most market entrenchment and it's done between each other laterally. It's not done with the consuming and I hate that's not even who we are. We are not a consuming public. We are people out here and we are not at that table not because somebody is purposely shunning us but because the power at the table is between the corporations and the corporations control the air. They control what goes into that air. If you're asthmatic, if you're sitting in traffic with carbon monoxide hitting you, if you're going around with phosphates hitting your senses, detergents, uh, chemical sprays that are under um, aerosol pressure, cleansers that are too harsh for the lungs, kinds of chemicals used in building and manufacturing anywhere you may go around, you can almost get a new negative body sensation from smells every other block these days. All these things being manufactured and used all around, taking up everybody's airspace, everybody's clean, fresh, free air to breathe, cutting down the trees, using them as renewable, getting rid of old forests. That's not the way Mother Nature works. People that are corporations owning the air we breathe, corporations owning the food supply, agribusiness, grabbing more and more agricultural land and using mass farming techniques on it, the result of which you are seeing now, the result of which gives us 
the phosphates in our water that pollute the water streams, the result of which that gives us insecticides and pesticides that build and build in the soil and then eventually find their way to the water and possibly deform our poor little frogs and other more sensitive creatures that bite the dust quicker than we do. Though why don't we check out some of our hospital wards and see the nature of what some of our fellow human beings are suffering. So corporations control the food supply and why are oranges practically 80 cents each or so imported from over the world and also from Florida and California when in fact the commodity price of oranges is identical to what it was practically in 1986 yet to the consumer trying to buy a nice fresh orange the price is going up 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 supposedly we don't have inflation control of the food supply control of the processing of food control over whether food will be fresh and grown by individual people and whether you can just bite into something nice and real that isn't pesticided or whether you are more and more constrained to buy something that is boxed and processed and frozen and stored and dead and chemicalized beyond what it natural chemical is and corporations control the oceans corporations and government corporations working with government getting contracts to develop radioactive submarines radioactive power on the ocean corporations running cruise ships that that trash the ocean with the rubbish that they that they dump into the water and are fined for nuclear power plants that recycle their cooling using ocean water which changes the heat levels which is so much an intricate part of how the ocean maintains or is shouldn't even have to maintain should naturally be so many ways making the ocean so dirty, so unfit for life, and so unfit for its role in planet Earth. And its role will always be mightier than anything humans can meet out, even if its physical nature is drastically changed. Corporations controlling the water, all the toxins seeping in underground, all water running together. Mm, what isn't in your water? I dare you would check out what kind of chemicals and debris and bacteria are in the water. Should we even be having a system where we're sending sewage to the water, including sewage that we try to refine? Should there even be such a system of sending sewage through the water anymore? And what about the water crises that we are doomed to face in other countries and even here as we go into future years? Water, the most precious commodity of the world. How would you even dare to put something not clean and pure into water? Something not naturally organic and non-harmful into pure water and corporations control what happens to animals because animals have to try to find food running over roadways getting smashed all over the place this summer and every summer more and more and more smashed 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 animals mothers on their ways to babies bigger animals you hear of development in the Amazon, in, in areas where humans should not even be treading, where natural dense growth should just be left alone for regulation of temperature and atmosphere and rainfall. People invading areas. We have so much area already, we should control our population here and everywhere in the world and make use of what we do have and preserve what is still unused. And so very little of that, if any, is pristine anymore. Places like Papua New Guinea are being 
exploited. So poor animals, everything is devastatingly under control of this blindsided lemmings over the edge, corporate structure, competitive, cut each other's throat to get market share, no matter what's in it, let's not delve into it, let's not stop, let's not try to think, let's call it heresy, let's call it against the American way. If we would dare to try to say, we've got to stop cutting down trees, we've got to stop burning fuels, we've got to stop building buildings the way we build them, we've got to change, we've got to stop using insecticides, we've got to stop chemical and aluminum production the way we know it, we've got to stop painting cans, we've got to stop having cartons that are plasticized, and all kinds of unnecessary things that are merely adding up to, in essence, a lower quality of life. And corporations control even the drugs that we are or aren't going to have in terms of medicinal purposes. For example, if medicines, so to speak, are purchased through HMOs in the pharmacy, through HMO memberships in the pharmacy, a person will pay approximately one-third as much for a medicine as a person will pay for that same medicine if purchased as not a member of an HMO, but just a private individual. Why should such a circumstance as that be able to exist? This, this point that I'm making changes somewhat from the pollution issue to an equity issue, but it illustrates again the corporate control that is inimical to people's health and welfare. And often, without rhyme or reason, if people were the ones at the table, if people, rich people, poor people, middle people, any people, were what the interests were about. Now, here are some separate issues that aren't about environment, and I'm bringing several of these together because they're all happening around us and I like to bring them to your attention because they should be alarmingly on our minds, not as problems but as the things that we should be dutifully taking care of instead of the crazy kinds of things that we're trying to think about like how to manufacture something that really has no use per se but can, but can generate some, some temporary or longer term interest that may not be for the health and benefit of pe people but just has a kind of marketing uh, appetizingness to it. But really serves no useful human purpose in making people better, calmer, happier, more relating, healthier, less lonely, satisfied, has nothing to do with that. So let's look at something else here. And this concerns, again, corporate, corporate kinds of ideas. There are also individuals that do these kinds of things. But corporations certainly are getting into more and more ways of, of using their control, exerting their influence, putting pressure on people to get them to keep on handing over money. And don't forget the economy is based on people, rich people, poor people, middle people, handing over money constantly. So we want to try to see how much money we can get out of each person's pocket, generating ways of doing this, generating ways of having a grip over how much money can be gotten out of people's pockets. That's really what it is. One doesn't have to have an ill motivation to be in this mindset. It merely is the marketing mindset of the day. It's considered the American way because words have been twisted as to what is the American way and what freedom should mean in a country. But recently, I got a, an offer from a major 
telecommunications firm that also was offering a, a credit card. However, the offer came as an offer to get a credit card with a very attractive interest rate for a limited period and to get 100 hours of free calling service as a bonus to applying for the card. It was all very pretty, all very promotionally suggestive, but nowhere did it tell you on this offer that when you signed up to, to get the credit card, those 100 free hours that supposedly would be yours were because the telecommunications company would automatically bump you from whatever long distance carrier you had, and there's a name for that, the likes of which I don't know, and then make you their long distance, make themselves your long distance carrier. Nowhere in the promotion was this noted, that you would, you would be automatically switched by them into being their customer in their long distance. Another way to do the same thing that has been complained about for some years now since all these new telecommunications companies have sprung up and are competing with each other. Another thing this credit card offer didn't tell you is that if you switched any balance transfers onto it, there would be a fee to do that and nowhere was that this mentioned. Think about the kinds of controls that are being exerted on people that these kinds of things ha can be done to you by official institutions that are considered bona fide corporations not giving you, and this is happening more and more, the plain facts, the pressure put on people to grab them, to hold them, to have sort of a one-sided relationship with how, how the commerce is going to proceed and how you are going to have to abide by this one-sided, we can't even call it relation, we call it connection, if you will association, if you will, not even association. Think about that. It's outrageous, the kind of things that are being pulled on people. Then there's another thing that I noticed some Republican candidates have brought up, which I've been quite interested in myself. New charges cropping up all the time on your long-distance telephone bills that are, quote-unquote, defended because they are mandated by the Federal Communications Commission, which apparently mandated them because Congress, not too long ago, put through some legislation that would allow the FCC to mandate these changes. And let's look at what some of these changes are that are cropping up on your phone bill. We've got a subscriber line charge that the locals charge people, the local telephone companies charge people so that well, they charge the long distance carriers. 350 a single line, 607 two lines, and 920 for more lines. Let's see here. No, 607, you add, add uh, one more line, and I don't know how the costs go up. Suddenly, there's a new cost for something that has been in existence and never cost anything for all these years. Now the locals who are trying to get into the long distance business, and this is not to fault them against the long distance carriers, are having battles, but the people at the table when these things are being worked out and regulated and mandated for you to pay, you the middle and upper and lower and rich and poor and in between person, for you to pay, you're not on that. It's between the companies. The long distance carriers are being charged to have access to the local companies. So now, of course, this charge is being passed on to you, but get the other rub. The other rub is that at the time the FCC quote-unquote mandated this, and if you try to call the FCC, you'll be on the phone on a menu for about a half an hour trying to listen and find where you should talk. You won't get a human, 
and you'll never be able to question and you'll never get a response back. And when you try to ask the phone companies about these things, they tell you to call the FCC. And one thing, if you listen long on the FCC, it finally tells you that the long distance companies are obliged to tell you what this is all about. But when you go back and ask the long distance companies what it's about, they get angry and tell you it's mandated by the FCC and they don't want to hear that the FCC said that they should have to explain it to you. But anyway, the long, the, 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 uh, the long distance companies, though they were going to have to pay this new access charge, which of course they get passed on to you, and I'm sure we're paying more than what they are paying to have the access. I'm sure of that. Uh, they got some very big tax breaks and other kinds of, of breaks for their business. I don't know that it's very substantial that supposedly more than covered what this cost was going to be to them. But in spite of that, they turned around and passed it on for people to pay. <clears throat> And of course, this charge is apt to go up. Just another way to have a charge for you. By the way, I heard recently, supposedly, that ATM usage is down, supposedly because people didn't like to pay the charges all the time. And this is what people need to do. They need to be more aware that you just, just don't keep paying. You just don't keep living with pollution. You just don't keep living with environments that are out of whack. You don't just keep feeling powerless. You don't just keep going with the flow. You think. You use your brain. You're a human. You use your brain. You have thoughts about these things. Another charge is called, these are all recent charges, universal services charge. And, and this, the, the front runner for the Democratic nomination at the present time happens to have been instrumental, I believe, in this charge, and I don't agree with it. This is not to say I'm not in agreement with the candidate. I am not in, in agreement, certainly, with this feature. Uh, this universal services is so that Internet and other kinds of, of uh, telecommunications, kinds of equipment and infrastructure will be going out to the low-income and rural areas and to schools and libraries and so forth. And uh, the companies are charged about 4%, and this is adjusted every quarter, which means it'll be going up. And uh, we get charged for that 44 to 5.4% on our bills right now. By the way, these are new charges, and the country seems to be asleep and so busy, and I don't blame them. Who can keep up with all this stuff? But this is another feature I'm trying to alert you to, like this, a, like this credit card that I, was, that I was pointing out with the promotion of 100 free hours, which switches you. These are charges that are constantly being added to you, and you're just powerlessly paying it and not thinking about how are we living, what's going on here, where is the equity, what kind of business is this really all about, and whatever happened to business that has a pliability to it, that has, that has the customer on the pedestal that is so worried to please the customer instead of just dictate to the customer and control the finances of the customer and, and uh, account for any account, in, an account, any account and any monies that a customer might work for and own. And then we come to our very own city of Boston. Oh, Boston. Boston, Boston, Boston. Boston with its parking tickets. Mm-hmm. Talk about quality of life. I'll tell you a story. One time, I parked my vehicle in a... I parked my vehicle. Let me tell you the story exactly. I came home late at night to my neighborhood, which I know like the back of my hand for many years, know where all the parking spaces are, know what's right, know what's wrong. Came home late at night, pulled in as usual, went on my merry way, so satisfied that I had a good parking spot, came out a couple of days later to find my vehicle wasn't there, and way up high, over 10 feet high, was a sign, handicapped parking, that had been put there between when I parked and when I came back. 
Of course I had tickets. Of course I had the towing charge. And of course I tried to go to City Hall to contest it. But no one at City Hall through the plexiglass windows would hear of my dilemma how someone who is very careful of where she parks her vehicle, who knows all the ins and outs late at night, would not be thinking to suddenly look up in the sky if there was some new sign there when the habit is to be doing this for years. Couldn't hear of it, couldn't imagine it. Had no mercy. And so I paid an enormous bill, and it broke my heart. I called officials in the city government. I called different departments, and nowhere could I get relief. This was just one of many horror stories that we can hear. It's also very curious, whether we're in the city of Boston or anywhere, why we should have such stiff penalties for an infraction, so to speak, which it really isn't, of not having a quarter in a meter. Should there even be a punishment, and even though there shouldn't, does the punishment fit the crime? And are not, as a behavior medicine specialist, with which I am, how many people get seized in their heart, get stomach ulceration, activity going on when they return to a vehicle to find that ticket, just trying to do their work as they go around the city of Boston. Should you be double parked or on a crosswalk or at a hydrant, that is logical. But the vast volume of tickets really don't have rhyme or reason. And I'm sure people would never feel as dismayed, generally speaking, getting a ticket at a fire hydrant, which most people would never park at, or a handicapped, as they would getting a ticket at a meter. It's a sad story indeed, and it does a lot of harm to people. And recently we had parking fees go up. It was barely mentioned. And I thought it was something that was merely being toyed with, but lo and behold, I have a ticket here and I see that the fees have gone up by five, ten dollars. Meter fee unpaid is now twenty-five dollars. A loading zone is now thirty dollars. A no parking is thirty dollars. But the ones we're mainly concerned with are the meter fees, twenty-five dollars. That's a lot of money, ladies and gentlemen. That's a heartbreaker. That's a lot of money. It's not working for people or with people. It's working against people. The point being that overall, there are a lot of reasons to be of entirely different mindsets than we ordinarily are about what we're trying to focus on and think about. I could be here all week, every hour of the day, all month for that matter, outlining all the things that have gone out of balance in the wrong direction against making the best environment for, for us to live convivially together, for us to live um, in a kind of way that makes us feel good and makes us want to um, feel like being with each other, feel like continuing with life, and uh, sleeping well at night, and uh, feeling optimistic in the morning. Um, a, a, a kind of quality that, that gives us sunshine for as many days as traditionally we've always had it. You remember, you remember in the winter last year, and many winters, we had so many unusual amount of days during which the sun didn't shine. And people were wondering, will the sun ever come out? These are, these are abnormalities. These are not right. Now in the summer, people were wishing, why won't it rain? Because it wouldn't. And why won't the sun go in so it would at least be some degrees cooler as people suffered? So, so many things about 
just the basics of what life should be like, the long lines at the grocery stores, the, the, the hugeness of retail making bigger and bigger uh, uh, setups in, in which you have to maneuver instead of nice, one-to-one -one smaller relationships where goods and services are provided uh, in spaces categorical to what they are instead of just massively put out for more for more anonymity and 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 monotony and uh, imperviousness and impersonality to the life that we're living just passing each other not knowing each other we could go on and on that the ways we're living are just not good to say the sense is, to say that they don't make a heck of a lot of sense, and we've got to think of not only how our money is being spent, but why it's being spent, and what causes are are coming out of out of the way the enterprise, the energy, and the work workness of people is being spent is not being spent truly productively and it's not being spent truly rationally and it's not being spent in a way that affirms life and gives hope. And of course we know all the things that are going on around us that show how stressed, angry and without hope people are much of the time. And how people may find out after a lot of trials that what they thought they were after rings hollow and they're coming around trying to find something that has more meaning. We're looking for some kind of meaning in life. We're looking for a kind of true morality. A morality of what the most we can be as humans What's the most we can make of ourselves? Can we aspire and attain some kind of nobility in our personalities, in our, in our cause and effects of who we are, what we bring about, what, what, what we create, how we live? And there's a lot of people, including the ones that are poorly understood and certainly not largely represented in the media, except as odd side stories, curiosities. There are a lot of people and there are a lot of young people that are angry. There are a lot of people, including myself, who do not like where life is going, who reject where life is going, who don't have to drop out and be completely antithetical to where life is, who are products of this commercial experience and to some degree incorporate that and like it, but who know that things are fundamentally not right and not the way they should be, and that consensus think and brainwashing and unidimensional programmed respondings of in living rather than really living and thinking for oneself and trying to do something that's human without taking courses in it or going to special places to feel spiritual as a side as a side part of what one's existence is that the natural fabric of life <laughs> should be and could be altogether different and 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 that is where life properly is meant to go um, for those persons who like religion, I don't think that going up to heaven and uh, meeting St. Peter or meeting God, however one would like to characterize it, and telling God that uh, one had a very successful IPO in 1997 and increased one's wealth fivefold and took away market share to a certain percent from another company. I don't think, for those that are religious, that's going to be the kind of net result that we'll have to show. And I'd like to see ourselves, if one is religious, which, which I am not, explaining why the earth is destroyed, 
why the trees die, why the fish die, why the water temperatures are changing, why the kids are being born with cancer, heart disease, why, why kids are getting asthma, why we are poisoning our fields and our crops, why we eat food with poison on it, why we put animals in laboratories, why we drill holes in their brains. why we make hermetically sealed environments that, that then rely on going deep into the ocean to explore for, for gas and oil to, to uh, have energy to fuel the air conditioners against the sun which is already way too hot blaring down on the glass windows heating the building even more high up in the sky without ventilation. Uh, I think uh, for those who are religious there will be some explaining to do if people like to look at things that way. I mean, that's just a metaphorical way. Don't take that literally because I don't mean it literally, but I'm trying to convey that the direction we are treading, the paths we lead, are stupid. It's just that simple. They're, they're downright stupid. And they're hardly tapping into what we can be. Some of you have probably seen um, this week, it didn't get much press, that pediatricians have advised that uh, young children, babies, uh, one, two-year-olds, not watch TV whatsoever because they just passively take it in and then they can't think for themselves, they don't learn as well. And I did a show called um, Sports Mania, Money Mania, Work Mania, which dealt with why kids can kill after the Columbine shootings and, and how the new kind of wired individual is, is going on to exist such that those of us who grew up in different kind of methodologies with relationships would not even be able to understand or get, get the idea of, of where people could be coming from who are wired by this passive connection to media conditioning the brain. I don't care if we would become more intelligent or less intelligent because that could be just just a smoke screen as well. But, but, to think that we would not become everything we could be as human beings and fulfill our lives to, to go to our hearts, to go to our hearts, to try to work towards what love is without being fancy schmancy about it, holding hands and purposely trying to make it happen, but just in every day to try to get closer without really meaning it to the fundamental nature that's going to get us less lonely, more in communion, less bigoted, less, less, isolating and more glorifying as a group of people just by the nature of how we're living together and loving life and every time we see life be it organic life that is plant be it organic life that is animal be it organic life that is human which is also animal that we know it, that we love it, that we respect it that we live amongst it, that we don't destroy it, don't poison it don't choke it off. Don't hurt it. Where is life going? What's your life worth? What are you going to say on Judgment Day if that's the way you think about it? What are you going to say when you say that I invented polyvinyl chloride and polyvinyl chloride caused a lot of harm to Mother Earth? I say, bow down to Mother Earth. I say, wake up. I say, here's a big clock and the time is now. Rattle your brain. The time is now. Wake up. 
Don't be stupid. Make sense. Have meaning. Good night. Godspeed, so to speak. Please tune in again. Thanks for watching.